wonder why you can't get along with that person you can't stand. Listen up, zombies. Yeah. Yeah. Would you consider yourself to be a good apple? So you're Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> to me, you're white. Am I wrong? I mean, if you see white, <laughs> work on your kids. They're going to need it. That's not love that's in the air. You can't out sin God's grace. Hello, and welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host, the Wretch. The song refers to um, dramatic role play number one. You get over here, you idiot. Honestly, man, such a bonehead when it comes to being on time, hitting your mark, making the cue. Chipotle is crummy. Did you see the lawsuits? Zaxby's is better than. Huh. Dramatic role play. Number two, hey, 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 oh, hey, thanks for showing up. You really, you do a great job. Um, <laughs> Chipotle, but Zaxby's, um, that's the kookiest thing. Dramatic role play, number three. Hey, Adrian, if you get a chance, could you come over here, bro? Hey, listen, I know how much you love going to Chipotle. Yes. Tell me your favorite part about it. Eating it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's my favorite part. You know what? Have you ever been to Zaxby's? I have. Yeah. A and which do you think is better? I'm definitely, without a, without a doubt, Chipotle is better. Yeah. You know, I wonder if we could talk about that because I've been going to Chipotle, and I don't know if you realize this, they're Southern Baptists <laughs> who own it. And Okay. You get the moral to the story, don't you? Which approach would you be more responsive to? Uh, may I ask you a more specific question? How do you approach people with whom you are having some sort of clash? Rick Thomas, as always, he is so good. Make sure you visit rickthomas.net. Hundreds of articles like this one to help you deal with various and sundry issues, but in this instance, relational conflict. There is something that you and I must be, not do, not think, but be if we're actually going to enter into having a difference of opinion with somebody, or when circumstances just collide, how do we resolve them? Uh, let us take a look at what Rick Thomas thinks is the key. The key to relational conflict. And let's be honest, do we not have a ton of it? Whether it's at church, it's at work, it's at home. How do you engage with somebody to actually persuade them? Or at least come to an amicable resolution. What is the key? This from Rick Thomas. The first step in relational communication is genuine affection for the other person. Uh-oh. That means you and I cannot just do something to negotiate a better deal. Instead, we have to be something. You see, no matter how hard I try to get you to think that I'm really for you, if I am not actually on your side, feeling some sort of affection for you, you know it. And what happens in a conflict? The dukes go up and ding, it's time for round one. You and I cannot fake this. This is not something that we can bring to the art of the deal. Instead, it is something that the Christian should be. Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. You say, I, I do like people. Uh, the people that I live with, I, I, I do care about them. I, I wouldn't say that I don't like them because I, I do. I even love them. That's true. But if in the moment of conflict, you're mad, you're not loving them. Now, again, overall, big picture, you love your spouse, you love your kids. But in the moment when there's a conflict and you're kind of getting, mm, you're not loving them in the moment. And that is not the same thing as saying you don't love your wife and children. It means that you are actually not treating them in a loving manner because in that moment, you're not. There's another emotion that is dominating and it is anger. The problem with that kind of anger, it's a murderous type. So you will then engage in the conflict with your ax sharp and just ready to mm, 
because that's what anger does. That's what James tells us in James chapter 4. You want something. You want this. The person in your life wants that. They come into conflict with one another because they don't match up, and you murder. That's what James says. You murder because you're not getting what you want, so you're murdering them. Why? Because you are not putting them before yourself. You are not living the way that Jesus lived on earth and in heaven by being sacrificial, by being submissive, by being a servant. That is the position. That's the direction that our whole life should be aimed. And when we are not aimed in that direction and we run into somebody who is in conflict with us, get ready and let the fireworks begin. How do you know if you are loving somebody? What are the marks? What are the signs that you're actually being loving in conflict? According to Rick Thomas, there are at least eight, eight of them. Here we go. Number one from Rick Thomas. You are more willing to listen to them than speak to them. That's a sign you love somebody. That is a sign that you are for somebody. That's a sign that you're more interested in their needs, their concerns, than your own. Number two, you regularly pray for them. May I ask you a question? Before you sit down with the kids, before you sit down with your spouse to correct her for that problem again, have you been praying for your wife and kids? Have you been praying for your husband and children? Have you been demonstrating you are so for them? Have you been listening to them? Do they sense, yeah, yeah, that person on my side and not mm, 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 another sign you're for somebody? Number three, your speech builds them up. Number four, you quickly repent when you are harsh to them. Uh, if you are having perpetual conflicts in your home at work, most likely these two things aren't happening. It's because you're not loving. You're, you're not sacrificing. You're not esteeming others. So you don't build them up. You, you don't do things for them. You don't help. You're not on their side. And it shows. And so when a little rub happens, come. Boom! Another sign, though, that you're loving people. You're quick to guard your tongue so you do not hurt people. Uh, Psalm 141, number six. You speak wisdom to them so you can serve them. Not so you can lecture, but so that you can serve them. That's a different position, isn't it? It's a different mindset. If you sit down with the kids to just teach them wisdom so that they can stop getting on my nerves. And that's how it's going to sound, no matter how hard you try to fake it. But if you sit the kids down and open up the book of Proverbs because you want them to live this abundant life that is in line and in sync with true wisdom because you want them to experience the joy that you know of trying to walk in the footsteps of your Savior, it's going to come across a lot differently. Number seven, you are selective in your speech so you do not sin against them. Number eight, you carry them in your heart. You have genuine affection for the people in your family, at work, in your church. And if you do, if you have that I love people, then your conflict, it's going to go down in intensity and in number. But I know what you're thinking. Well, that's nice. That's, that's good. good. Good advice. Good principles. Well, if that's all that it is, if those eight signs of somebody who has affection for other people, who is for people, is just a system to reduce the conflict and tension in your home, then it's completely failed because that is not what Christianity is. Instead, God wants you to be those things, so you exhibit those things, so that you are behaving the way he does. How do you get to that place next on Wretched? It's fair to look into the windows of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to determine if the president lives in the White House. Similarly, it's fair to look into the pages of Scripture to see if God inspired the Bible. Helping Christians have confidence in the Bible is one of our main missions. 
That's why Wretched produces DVDs like Beyond the Shadow of a Doubt and Wretched Radio and Wretched TV. Wretched, amazing grace, amazing gospel. Prepare for not just one, but eight. <laughs> Welcome back to A Wretched. Rick Thomas, as he so often does, he gets to the core of so many of our emotional issues, specifically relational conflict. Prepare yourself. This might sting a wee bit. Rick Thomas writes this, What comes out of your mouth toward the other person? reveals your heart attitude toward them. Don't gloss over this. If you are unkind, harsh, stubborn, mean-spirited, crude, or any other unloving speech pattern toward another person, then your heart is broken and needs restoring. <coughs> Number one, how do you know if you're loving the people in your life? How do you talk to them? That's it. That's the test. How do you get along? Because if you're loving them, you don't speak to somebody harshly, severely. Not when you're loving them. It's in the moments when you're not loving them. When your heart, I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but in the moment you're really not thinking like one and you're not acting like one because you are not loving your neighbor as yourself. How do we get over that? How do we stop doing that? Not so fast. How do you know if you're one of those people who has a heart issue, are you one of those people who actually prefers to live like an enemy? This from Rick Thomas. Sign number one, you want to live like an enemy? You had rather win an argument than redeem the relationship. Again, do a heart check. When you enter into any sort of conversation, as simple as where are we going for dinner tonight, do you need to win? Do you have to have your way? If that is you, all the time, some of the time, in those moments, you're not actually loving people. A number two sign you like to fight, you have a hard time asking for forgiveness. Why? Why should I have to ask for forgiveness from those people who are clearly less than I am? Even if I did make a mistake, it's nothing compared to their sins. Sign number three, you like to live like an enemy. You'll not admit being wrong first. You will after she does. You will after he does, but not until then. It's not loving. Number four sign, you live like an enemy. You act as though the only perspective that is right is yours. This is a tricky one because in my instance, it actually is. And this is a great burden, <laughs> believe me. Do you always think you're right about everything? We do. We all, we all do. You get an idea in your head and it's the best one. You get a, an, a thought that this is the way that it should be done and that is it. You might as well just sign it and seal it. It is finished and there's no reason for conversation. It's a little old thing called pride. Ooh, every thought that I have I think is better than your thought because pfft, it's me. We're not. We're talking about myself here. And when I think like that, and when I talk like that, and when I refuse to ask for forgiveness, when I insist that my way or the highway, because it is the best way, I prefer to live like an enemy. Here's another sign from Rick Thomas. Number five, you do not enter the conversation as a learner, but a point maker. Number six, you devalue the person you are talking to by being unkind. Uh, side note, you want your kids to run away as soon as they turn 18? Be this parent. Just go ahead. Or oh, they'll put up with you. Uh, they'll, they'll maybe act on the surface. You get that simmering sense, but on the surface they're doing okay. You just wait. They turn 18, it goes to 212, they boil over because they're furious at you because you've been treating them unkindly. Another sign you prefer to be an enemy. Your communication to the other person is dis r e s p e c t -ful. You're not even polite, somewhat dismissive, maybe condescending. 
And the issue for all of these signs that you prefer to live like an enemy is very simple. It's a lack of love. It's a lack of heart. Why? Because the Bible tells us that out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Do you want to know how you feel about somebody? How do you talk to somebody? It's not complicated. If you're in fights a lot, you're just, you're hating. You're not loving. So how does the Christian go about the business of not just in general loving people? I love my family. I love my church family. But individually, in the moment, how do you love even when you are not perhaps feeling it in the moment? You guessed it next on Wretched. Do you really believe that something came from nothing? Yes. Ready? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ didn't exist and walk the planet? Yes. Do you have a Dan Barker in your life? Todd Friel debated the president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Are you prepared to engage an atheist? That's why Wretched produces DVDs like The Case for Atheism and Wretched Radio and Wretched TV. Wretched. Amazing grace. Amazing gospel. Do you know the one person in all of history who never got into a slap fight? Welcome back to Wretched. You know who never did that? Jesus Christ. Not only did he never get into one of these with somebody, he never got into a verbal you and I just me. Even when he was righteously indignant with the Pharisees for leading people to hell, the ache in his voice how will you escape the judgment? Even in righteous indignation, the hearers understood this man loves. Jesus modeled for us what it means to speak, talk, act, and think like so that we could make sure that we resemble him, we reflect him. How does God act? Look at Jesus, who is God, in flesh, and that should tell us how we should act. And that is the goal, isn't it? If you and I stare at Jesus with unveiled face, beholding God incarnate, we will be changed from glory unto glory. In other words, we're going to become closer and closer to our glorified status where we become partakers of the divine nature here. Never until we are translated over and we are glorified, but progressively. The more we study Jesus, the more we look at him, the more we listen to his words, the more we're going to think like him and talk like him and act like him. And we will not be getting into the conflicts that so often tear down our homes, which should be sanctuaries of joy, and we turn them into war zones. Rick Thomas, he is a very fine biblical counselor, helps us to understand what it is that we should be thinking about, what we should be like to avoid conflict. We should be like Jesus. We should be loving people. Remember, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God didn't love the world after Jesus, only he loved the world before because God loves us. And we, if we are going to be like him, should be loving people, even those who get up our nose. So how do we get to this place? Rick Thomas writes, the first step toward resolution is to reaffirm your allegiance to this one gospel truth. Christ loved you when you were unlovable, and he continues to love you as you continue to be unlovable. Let's be honest. As Christians, we have a tendency to think, I'm doing all right here. I mean, I'm not like those pagans. Have you seen the way that they act on those cable channels like MSNBC? I'm not like that. Clearly God loves me because, frankly, I'm rather lovable. And even as Christians, how much do we sin and disobey? And yet God persistently, perpetually loves us with a profound love if we are in Christ. And that knowledge and that understanding transforms us not into just acting in a loving manner, but being loving because we have been so loved. This from Rick Thomas. If you are willing to be Christ to the other person, 
then you can move to the next step in conflict resolution. If you're not willing to be Christ to the other person, then whatever you do will not be satisfying or redemptive. Make no mistake about it, you might get behavior. You might get control. Hey, quit running, you kids, on it. Okay, they might slow down for you. They, they might do what they're told, but it won't be redemptive. And you won't be a peacemaker. Instead, you'll just be a bit of a jerk. Rick Thomas writes, The way you change your heart is by realigning it to the clarity, truth, and power of the gospel. When you get into an argument, when there's a conflict that's happening, whatever the realm happens to be, one or both of you is not acting Christ-like. That's it. Because Jesus doesn't get into one of those, but you are. So you must not be acting like him in the moment or the other person. Somebody, or both of you in that instance are not acting Christ-like. How do you become more and more Christ-like? You behold the glory, the unveiled glory of Jesus Christ. You read those Gospels and you read about justification and you read about sanctification and glorification and all that he has done and is going to do for us. And you see it exhibited in Jesus Christ while he walked this earth and ministered to people who hated him, and yet he loved them. And it changes you progressively. The more you focus on him, the more you will be able to look at people and think in these five ways. From Rick Thomas, number one, I'm going to be Jesus to fill in the blank. Number two, I am going to change whatever I need to change in order to be Jesus to fill in the blank. Number three, I am going to wash so-and-so's feet. You know, the way Jesus did, even for Judas Iscariot. Number four, I am willing to die for fill in the blank. You know, the same way that Jesus died for you. And uh, finally, number five, I am willing to humble myself as evidenced by setting aside my rights for that person with whom you are regularly having conflict. Now, how do you act like that? You stare at the one who is like that and progressively you will become like that and your conflicts will start to dwindle. Until tomorrow, go serve your king.